Thank you for listening to Liberty Christian Center's podcast. Let's join Pastor Paul Carlson for today's message. Praise the Lord. It's good to see all of you. We're in for a good day today. I heard Dana say it a few times that that, uh, baptism day is one of her favorite days of the summer, is getting down and and seeing people just make that dedication to, to Christ and what he's done in their lives. And so, you know, in this service, we're going to spend some time, we're going to talk about baptism. We're in a series, we call it Down to Earth. So we've, we've squeezed this one into the series, because, you know, really, it is getting real. Being water baptized and, and uh, you know, just making a declaration to the world that, hey, God's done something in me that's incredible. And, you know, what happens in, a, in the life of a believer you know, should never just be put off to some future state. You know, I mean, God is real right now. Could you say amen to that? I mean, I, I, I remember just as a new believer, you know, back in the 70s, I got born again, and I'd, I'd go home at night, and God was so real to me. You know, I'd read his word, and, and, and you know, the Bible is like a, a treasure map. You know, it's a treasure map, you know, that's to take us on a journey and lead us to experience with him. You know, that's really what it's about. You know, it's not just a book that, that you know, well, it's, it's such a grand book, you know. I mean, this is how it used to be for me. It was like, oh, I, I actually had one in my apartment even before I was saved. You know, I had a Bible, and I thought it looked cool. Dusted off every now and then. Never, never really read it, you know, but, but there it was. You know, then I get born again, and I open that up, and it's like, wow, I'm finding... I'm finding a path to know God. And, and so, man, I tell you what, the experience that you have with him, don't ever minimize it. Don't ever minimize it because it's fantastic. It's real. And, you know, as we walk with him here on this earth, he's going to manifest himself to us more and more as the days go on. Now, there's coming a day. There is coming a day. When we are in eternity, we're in heaven. Is that going to be a bad thing? No, it's going to be a tremendous thing. It'll blow our minds, you know. People that, that in the Bible that have written about it, you know, sometimes it's just fun. You know, the Apostle Paul was so real and upfront. He said, man, I saw things I can't even tell you with human words, you know. Do you ever try to communicate in another language? I lived in Haiti for a number of years, and my, my mastery of the, the language was never at a point where I would preach on my own, you know. If I tried to, people usually laughed, and it wasn't for the right reason. And, and, and you know, actually, while I lived there, sometimes I found out that words I learned didn't mean exactly what I thought they meant, and I got in trouble sometimes in any case. But I'm telling you what, you can, you can be limited, limited in, in expressing yourself. And the Apostle Paul said this. He says, I had a, an experience. I went up into the third heaven, and he said, I saw things I couldn't even tell you about. Heaven's real. Heaven's real. It's not just some, you know, mysterious place. I mean, it's reality. There's people I know that live there right now, and that is our destination. But that said, God wants to show himself real in our lives today. Real in our lives today. So that's getting down to earth. Now, talking about baptism, you know, I've got a few scriptures. You might have imagined that. Uh, But in Hebrews chapter 6, I'm just going to start here this morning and and just read this. The writer of Hebrews said this in verse 1. He said, uh, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. Okay, did you hear this? Elementary principles of Christ. Let's go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God. Doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, and this will do if God permits. What I'm saying here is is the writer of Hebrews said this. He says there's some elementary principles. One translation said some basic doctrines of the church, and listed in those basic doctrines of the church is this the doctrine of baptisms. And, and so there's several different baptisms that, that the Bible talks about. There's Actually, this is the, the first most amazing one is when you get born again, 
you know, when's that? Well, you know, for me, it was back in the 70s, and I went forward, you know, a young hippie guy goes forward at this church meeting, and, and I, I just didn't know what I was doing exactly, except this, I knew I wanted God. And I prayed, and, and, and didn't have this magic prayer. It wasn't like, well, if you say it just this way, in this tone of voice, this will happen for you. No, it wasn't like that. All it was is my heart was crying out to God. I don't even know what I prayed except Jesus. And, and I know I left that place changed. You know what happened? I got baptized into the body of Christ. That's what happens right there. When you get born again, you get baptized into the body of Christ. Now, there's another baptism that, that we're talking about today is that after a person has actually received Christ, they make this public declaration, and it's called water baptism. And God is so cool. He's into these picture stories. You know, you look at the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus. It seems that everywhere he was, he was teaching people. And he would just take life lessons and paint a picture. He'd talk about fishing. He'd talk about sowing seeds, talking to the farmers. He'd talk to, you know, these people, and he'd hit them where they lived. And so he gave us this demonstration, this picture story to demonstrate what happened when we got baptized into the body of Christ. And, and what it is is this, is, is that when you go down into the water, it's like being buried with Christ, okay? You're partaking of his, uh, his suffering, of, of the work that he did. So you're buried with him, and then you get raised up from the water. It's walking, it's being raised up in the resurrection life that Jesus was resurrected with, you know? You, pay, you partake of what he did. You, you're showing the world, this is what happened to me. Did you ever do that? Did you ever, you know, I remember I, I kind of struggled. You know, the night I got born again, I ran into some friends, you know, at the 7-Eleven, went out for a drive, and I tried to tell them what happened. And, and honestly, I, I didn't have words to tell them. I didn't know a lot of Bible verses. You know, I just said this, I don't know what happened. But I know this, God loves me, and I know when I die, I'm going to heaven. That's all I could tell him. That was enough to make him look at me like, oh, wow, that's a new one. That's something, that's different. But Jesus takes it, and he says, look, guys, this is what happened, man. You went down, you were buried with me, you were raised up. And, you know, I like to think of it, too, that when you walk out of that today a river, you know, it's just, it's almost symbolic of, like, you're walking in the newness of life. You're walking. It isn't just a one-time thing. It isn't just something, well, yeah, I got it back then. No, it's an everyday thing. It's an everyday thing. Christianity is an everyday thing. It's letting God in to your life. It's letting him into your decision-making. It's letting him into, you know, uh, just the path that you're going to take, you know. I mean, don't get weird. Don't be sitting there in, your, in front of your closet going, all right. I'm not leaving this place till God shows me what shirt I'm wearing today. Mm. You know, and you get a goosebump or something. No, I'm not talking. That's weird. God doesn't call you to be weird. He calls you to be, you know, supernatural. But that's not weird, okay? That's why, you know, sometimes things get a bad taste because people have taken things and made them so, can I use this word, ooby dooby, that they're beyond the norm, okay? You know, the greatest manifestations of God's supernatural power, they just look really natural to people. They look very natural to people. It's an everyday way of living, just going about walking with God. Walking with God and showing people, you know, Jesus. All right, in Mark 16, Jesus' words, these are, are words that in my Bible are red letter. It simply means this. These are words that Jesus spoke. And, and it says this in verse 15. I love these verses. It says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he who believes and is baptized will be saved, and he who does not believe will be uh, condemned. Okay? What gets you saved or what gets you born again is simply believing, okay? Believing in Christ. But he says, Go out and, and, and be baptized. It says, In these signs, will follow them that believe in my name. They'll cast out demons. They'll speak with new tongues. I cut off right there. But basically, he says this. You're going to show a Christ life. This stuff is so real. God is living in you. Can you say that? Say, God's living in me. 
I, I, I tell this story sometimes back at, in the days when I worked at, uh, at Billy Graham's. And, and um, I, I'm reminded just because I, I was, actually I was at a funeral yesterday. Somebody that I knew had passed away, went to heaven. It was a, it was a celebration. And I saw some people I hadn't seen in decades. You know what that's like when you, when you see people you haven't seen in decades? You're like on high alert. Because everybody out there has changed over 20, 30 years except me. I mean, I'm the same. You know, I haven't changed at all. But, you know, you're trying to say, all right, do I recognize people? So I'm walking into the funeral, and I see this guy going, hey. You know, and he's got a head shaved and all this. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm rapidly just rolling. It's like a Rolodex going through your head. All right, all right, who, who is that? Who is that? And I walk over, and it's this guy. I, I, I tell this story sometimes. But... Uh, he, he, he was working out on the loading dock, and, and a forklift ran, ran right over his foot. And it was not just any forklift, it was our Yale forklift. For those of you who know what forklifts are all about, a, this Yale forklift was the one we used in, in like tight spaces, and it had hard rubber tires, okay? Not air-filled tires, but hard rubber tires. I actually took it after this event, I took it to the big scale and weighed it, weighed 6,900 pounds. So it was a big forklift, ran right over his foot. And, and uh, I, I, someone came and got me, and I ran out to the dock. And I just, what I did is just what this verse says. I went right up to him, and I laid hands on him. I said, in, you know, I don't know what I said, but I said something like, in Jesus' name, we just command this foot to be whole. And, and we walked away, and he got up, and he was totally fine. He's totally fine. And then the, the most amazing part of it to me is he went to, uh, he took his shoe off, and his sock had blood all over it. But he took his sock off and there was no, no blood. Nothing on, on the foot. Well, that's just Jesus. In fact, that guy and his wife, we went out that night. We went to a prayer meeting together. I remember that. So he was in there and he was going, hey, Paul. I go over and give him a big hug. But I tell you what, God's called you to go out and live the Christ life. Live the Christ life. You know, sometimes people have thought, what's the Christ life? It means, you know, you're just straight as an arrow. You know, uh, this is a term that I grew up with. They're like a Boy Scout. You know what I mean? Well, God wants you to be good. He wants you to be nice. He wants you to develop. Let him develop who you really are. He wants, you, he wants to take and change you from the inside out and, and, and get you to where you spend time with him and you just go express his life wherever you go, wherever you go. I mean, Dana and I, you know, we go to places, you know, that are not even church meetings. But we're like aware of God when we go. We're like, we find him everywhere. We'll go to a movie theater. I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting at a movie theater and God spoke to me and showed me things. Sometimes he's given me the sermon I'm going to preach next Sunday. And I'm like, cool. This is good study time. Yeah. Me and Jesus eating popcorn. Actually, I don't eat popcorn much anymore. But anyway, but when I did, I, I ate it with him. All right. So, <laughs> anyway, it, Jesus said, believe and be baptized. These signs will follow them who believe in my name. They'll cast out demons. They'll speak with new tongues. You know, man, make God part of your daily life. Prayer is not just some kind of a, I know I'm talking about water baptism, but I'm just going with it here. Prayer is not just some kind of a thing you do where you just hit your knees and, and you know, you're reverent for, for 30 seconds and then you go on your day. Prayer is an all-day experience. You know, you walk with him. You know, you, you, you're conscious. It's not like you're, you're, like I say, it's not like you're on your knees all the time. It's not like you're maybe even verbalizing everything all the time. But wherever you go, you're aware of him. You're aware of him. You know, when I'm hanging out with Dana, I'm aware of her. Sometimes I can, we can be sitting, walk, going on a walk, and we don't say nothing, but I'm enjoying her presence. You know what? God walks with you. He talks with you everywhere you go when you go to school, sitting at your locker. You ever have one of them experiences in school when, remember junior high, when you got your first locker with a lock on it? Back in grade school, we had lockers, but nobody was allowed to lock them. You know, I don't know why, but that's how it was. But then junior high came, and you go to your homeroom class, and they give you that uh, new combination lock, you know. And I don't know if it was just me, but I'd sit there, and i think, are you sure you got the combination right those first, you know, 15 times I did it? Hey, God's with you there. God's with you. Don't sweat the small stuff. Draw on his presence. Let him show you. Let him show you peace when you're under pressure. 
Let him show you that you can rise up, you know, even in peer pressure. Even, even when people around you, man, they all seemed, it seems like everybody around me got their lock on the first one. Boop. I'm like, hmm. But God's real. He's real. He helps us. He helps us in uncomfortable situations. You know, that's why Paul said, he says, man, doesn't matter who's against me. He's for me. Doesn't matter who's coming against me. Doesn't matter what they say. They might stand up in unison and sing a song saying bad things about me. But God's on my side. I can, I can go forward. I can go forward. So water baptism is a public declaration of your faith. You know, in today's world, you know how you know when relationships are really solidified? It's like I've done, I think I've done eight weddings this year. You know, and you know, they're at the altar, they're saying, I do, and they kiss, and they walk off. But when it really becomes official was, was when you turn to your Facebook page and it said, so-and-so got married. Isn't that true? Are you Facebook official? Have you gone public? Have you let everybody know? Water baptism. It's like going public. It's like going, I used to say this about water baptism. It's like me wearing my wedding ring. I, I, I got some oil in my, my finger this, this last week, and I took my wedding ring off, you know, because I've had this happen before where my, my skin gets sensitive there and it just gets irritated. And in fact, Dana said, take your ring off, because she remembered that happening a couple years ago. And, and um, so I took it off and I forgot it. And I, I came to work the next day. In fact, we were sitting in, in a, our staff meeting and, and, and going to pray or something. And, and all of a sudden, I didn't realize how often during the day I just subconsciously kind of move and, and adjust my wedding ring. <laughs> and I went, I went there in the meeting. I, I went to do that. And I went, <gasps> and, and, and people looked at me and they said, what's wrong? What's wrong? And it was like Kara. Kara knew right away. She says, you don't have your wedding ring on. You don't have your wedding ring on. And I said, no, I don't have it on. I felt so, so empty the whole day. I, I, I got home. The first thing I did is I went over to the, 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 the dresser there, and I found my wedding ring, and I put it on. I said, ah, it's been a part of me for 30 plus, 30 some years. That's a safe way to say it for me. <laughs> it's like adding the ish on the end of the time, you know, be there around 1030-ish, you know, gives you leeway. Anyway, but uh, I used to say wedding ring was like a sign of baptism. What it is is a public declaration to the world that, hey, I'm married to Dana. Well, now I'd say this, that, you know, water baptism is like that. It's a public declaration to the world that, that hey, I've accepted Christ. You know, it's like going public on Facebook. It's saying, hey, I'm in relationship. I'm in that status now. Let the world know. Let everybody know. Jesus is my Lord. So, you know, in the early church, it was a common practice, you know, is what they did when people got born again. Mark was telling me this morning that when he got, when he prayed and accepted Christ in the church that he went to, they just said amen and they got in the truck and they went down to the creek, 180, 190 mile creek, was it? Yeah. Anyway, creek, yeah. And anyway, went in there. He didn't explore the whole creek, but uh, he went down there and they baptized him right away. I thought, wow, that's so cool. So cool. Well, today we're, we're going to do that after this service. We're going to run down and, and people that may have not gotten saved today, but maybe have gotten saved and just never publicly made that declaration. Hey, I want to be water baptized. I want to follow what Jesus said. You know, for me, I did it when I was at a Bible camp in uh, Chicago, and, and I got baptized in a swimming pool. And it was a Baptist swimming pool, and it was a big deal because I wasn't a Baptist. I was a counselor at this camp, and they had to actually call their board and see if it was okay for them to baptize me. But, you know, I said, I believe in Jesus, and that was the credentials. That was the, that was the thing that put you through. I believe in Jesus. People say, what do I need to do to be baptized? It's real simple. You believe in Jesus. You believe in Jesus. You receive what he did. And that is all you need to do to, to be baptized. You know, it doesn't mean, well, I've, I've got to go six weeks in a row to church and sit in the same chair every week, probably go to both services, double dipper, you know, and then, 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 uh, then I can get bap. No, no, just believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. And you can be baptized. I remember last year when we did this, 
somebody at the last minute said, I want to be baptized. And they got in with their jeans and everything on and just went and got baptized. And they said, man, that was one of the best days of my life. Well, that's what we believe. This is one of the best days of your life, whether you're getting baptized or not. Acts 10.44 is, is one story of, of the, the early church. It says, while Peter was, was uh, speaking these words, this is in the house of Cornelius, uh, Italian man, a Gentile man, somebody who was not Jewish, and, and Peter was preaching. I love this story, one of my favorites in the book of Acts. And while Peter was preaching, it says the Holy Ghost fell on them, and they all got baptized in the Holy Ghost. They got saved and, and baptized in the Holy Ghost, started speaking in tongues. And, and here it is. It says, uh, well, I'll read it. It says that the Holy Spirit fell on all them that heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured on the Gentiles also. They heard him speak with tongues and magnify God, and then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized? And who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And then he commanded them to be baptized, or commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And they asked him to stay there a few days. It was a, it was a, a norm in the early church. Uh, people got baptized. They, they made a, a public demonstration of their faith. You know, you know in, in other cultures, I think baptism is even a bigger thing than, than some people in America. I know it's a big thing here. But in some cultures, it's just such a final thing about being baptized, you know. And, and uh, I'll tell you what, it's a big thing with God. God sees it. In, in Acts 8, there's another great baptism story, story of Philip and the eunuch. You guys know the story of Philip and the eunuch? So I think I'll just tell most of it. Philip, you know, he had, he, this was a big day, man. This was like, if, if, if this was the day that, that it was Groundhog's Day, this would have been a good day to relive over and over. But Philip, first off, Philip gets instruction from an angel, you know, to go on a journey. You know, I mean, that doesn't happen to me every day. And, and, and he says to go, and, and he's, he's on this, this trek, and he sees this guy, who, this chariot that's pulled over to the side of the road, and this guy is like, like reading the Bible. And, and, the, and the, Philip's instructed to go down and join himself to this chariot. In other words, he says, you know, go hop in. Go open the door, hop in, and sit with this guy for a while. You know, and, and so Philip goes down and, and he says, well, what are you reading to this guy? This eunuch, he turns out he's a eunuch from, uh, he's, he's in charge of the treasuries of this queen named Candace. And, and he says, I'm, I'm reading this, this book in Isaiah. And, and he says, he sa and Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? Well, what a thing to ask. I mean, would you like, can you imagine that, sitting on a plane with somebody next to you, and they're reading a book, and you say, hey, do you understand what you're reading? Well, that's what Philip said to the eunuch. He says, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch was so honest, he didn't try to put it on and say, well, of course I do. You know, sometimes, you know, people get so prideful that it keeps them from really receiving what God really wants them to get. And, and the, the eunuch says, how could I understand this unless someone unfolds it before me? So it happened that what the eunuch was reading was an actual prophecy about Jesus. And so Philip took it as an opportunity, and he stepped in, and he preached Christ to the eunuch. And right there, the eunuch accepted and received what Jesus had done for him, and, and, and he was born again. And, and you know what happened next? Is they said, Can any, is there any reason I can't get baptized right now? And Philip says, no, you believe that's all that's required. So they found water, and, and, and Philip baptized this, this eunuch. And it says this. This is kind of the cool part, too. It says that, that after this happened, it says the Spirit of God caught Philip away, and he wasn't there anymore. Well, that's another way of saying, beam me up, Scotty. And he got translated to a new place, and he went, and he kept right on preaching the Word of God. How cool is that? It's like this. It's just another day walking with Jesus. Just another day walking with him. Exciting things are in your path when you walk with him. Now, let me give you this one, too, in Acts 16. In verse 25, Paul and Silas are, are in jail. You know, someone who, who was just reading the Bible for the first time thought Silas was Paul's wife. But no, no, Silas is another guy. 
Another guy, and he was on, uh, he was like a partner with the Apostle Paul in preaching the gospel. And it says, at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the very foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep, seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Do you know why? Because he was the one that was in authority. He was the one left in charge. And he knew his goose was cooked. And he said, I can't, I'm not going to let them do to me what they're going to do. He was going to kill himself. And Paul cried out with a loud voice and said, do yourself no harm. We're all here. That, what a miracle that was. The doors were open, and they didn't leave. Why? Because there was a mission to accomplish. He called for a light, and he ran in, and he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house, and he took the same, the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into the house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. What a bold statement. He said, if you just believe, you'll be saved in your house. Now let me clarify this, that individuals need to make their own decision. God never pushes himself on anybody. You don't get born into a Christian family and automatically, bam, that means you're saved, okay? What it does do, though, is it when someone gets born again in a family, it opens the door. You watch. You watch over time. They're going to come in. They're going to come in. They're going to come in. You hear me? They are going to come in. Now, sometimes it takes a while. Dana had an uncle. I'll tell you, if you ever knew Grandma Peterson, she was a spitfire. I mean, you didn't cross her. She was a, 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 a good old Pentecostal woman, and she would just, I tell you, if she liked you, it was a good thing. If she didn't, look out. <laughs> and she had, how many kids did she have? 11 kids? 11 kids, which Dana's mother is the youngest, so thank God she had 11 kids. And, and um, the oldest son... His name was Harvey, and, and Grandma, I mean, she loved God, and, and uh, she loved me, too. I just want to tell you that, you know? She did love me, and, and, and uh, anyway, <laughs> she, she, she knew how to get a hold of heaven, and she prayed. She, she stood on the word for her kids, and one by one, they all got saved, except for Harvey. He was like the holdout. And, and uh, I, I talked to Harvey before, you know, and I, I, I just casually at a family reunion, but I think everybody had talked to Harvey at some time or another. And he'd just say, you know, I want to believe. I want to believe, but I don't believe. That's what he'd say. That was pretty much his answer to people. Well, on a Sunday night, his son-in-law, he's 89 years old, not the son-in-law, but Harvey. Okay, got that straight? Okay, so on, on, a, fr on a Sunday night, his son-in-law goes over, shares Christ with them. He gets born again. What happened? Well, I tell you what. You get one saved, they're all coming in. You know, they're given the opportunity. So he shared Christ, he got born again. He went home to heaven that Friday. He went home to heaven. So well, that's cutting her close. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm glad he made it. I'm glad he made the decision. And I tell you what, Grandma, Grandma Bessie, Grandma Peterson, she was in heaven already, but I can guarantee you this, she was doing a dance down the streets of gold. People don't think they don't know when things like that happen. You know, they don't care about everything that goes here on the, the earth. You know, they don't care that I had spinach in my eggs this morning, but they do know when people get born again. They knew when, know when people make advances in the kingdom. So what, what happened? They got born again right away. They found water. They baptized them. They made a public declaration. In Colossians 2 and verse 12, the Apostle Paul gives us this. He says, he says, Buried with him in baptism, in which you're also raised with him through the faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Who raised him from the dead. I'll read on. It says, In you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made alive together with him, 
having forgiven you all your trespasses. Isn't it good to be forgiven of all our trespasses? No weight hanging over our heads. Jesus, you know, uh, he took the weight. He took the penalty. He paid the price for our sin that we could be free. You know, baptism, man, it's just declaring this. It's declaring, I'm free. I like to think of baptism like this, and I'm, I'm coming to an end, okay, of this message. Baptism is like, just, it's like declaring your identification with Christ. Okay, that's, those are words. Is that theological words? Well, everybody knows what identification is. How do you function in this world? You have identity. You got credit cards. You got driver's license. You're going to travel somewhere. You need a passport, you know, if you're going to travel. You know, you go through the customs, and they pull it out, and they stamp that baby, and that's how they let you in. They look at the picture. They see that it's you, you know, and I try to say it's just only a resemblance of me, but I show it, and they, they let you go through, you know. Well, I tell you what, you're identified with Christ. I, I, I've been seeing this this week is that, that uh, sometimes as you're walking through life and you're having a challenge, like I'll just use this as an example, like sickness, okay? Sickness tries to come on you. And, and, and uh, you know, it, 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 it knocks on your door and it, it, it tries to make its statement in your life. One of the biggest mistakes we can make when some kind of infirmity tries to come on our being is to identify with it. To identify with it. You know, your mind can, your imagination can be used in the wrong way sometimes. God didn't give you imagination to imagine yourself bound up. He didn't give you imagination to, to see yourself, you know, it's like you get a twinge and you're like, all of a sudden, you know, you, your mind is going and, and you see the next stage and you see the next stage. All of a sudden, you're at your own funeral. And like I heard Dana say this week, she says, says, you're at your own funeral and you're looking around to see who didn't come because it's all in your mind. It's imagination. It's identifying. It's all of a sudden, instead of being attacked with some kind of a sickness or a infirmity, it's all of a sudden, that's who I am. I've embraced it. I'm going to live my life like this. I'm planning my vacations around it in my mind. No, identify with Christ. Identify with what he did for you. You might be right in the middle of a battle but don't let your mind go that, the wrong way, but let it go towards God. Let it go towards seeing the freedom and deliverance that's been provided. Let him go in this way. I've been identified with Christ, and he went to the cross. He became sin for me that I could be free from sin. He became sick for me so I could be free from sickness. Sometimes it's a sin that's holding people back. I, I tell you, I have mercy on people. We're all struggling in areas. There's nobody perfect among us here today. Even people being baptized, I'll go this far, even the people baptizing the people being baptized. We're all working on it. We're all working on living, working out this salvation that's on the inside of us. Paul said that in Philippians. He said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What did it mean? He, he was talking to people that were already born again. They had God inside them. They had, they had life inside them. They had salvation in them. He wasn't saying you got to do the work to be saved. No, he was saying what you got in you, you got to work it out, just like you work toothpaste out of a tube. You know, you got to squeeze it a little. You got to bend it a little bit. You got to roll up the end and get what's on the inside to the outside. That's how we are. Get it out. Work it out. Get what's in here on the outside. Some kind of sin has tripped people up in life. I'm telling you what, there's, there's redemption. There's, there's forgiveness. There's, I mean, you got forgiveness. There's, this is what I want to say. There's freedom for you. There's freedom for you. Don't let that thing entangle you. But see yourself free. See yourself loved. I, I, I've told this story. Some of you guys have heard my stories. A number of times but they're my stories so I got to tell them you know when I when I got born again you know in the 70s you know I got instantly delivered from stuff that I did you know drugs and all that kind of stuff threw away all my paraphernalia and all my my things you know that I had which was big big investment went down the tubes you know and and but but something that didn't I didn't get the freedom from right away was cigarettes you know so you know what? Can you smoke and go to heaven? Yeah, you can. 
As a matter of fact, if you do, you may go to, go to heaven quicker than if you didn't. Okay? It's okay, but God loves you. <clears throat> That's not the issue. But, you know, I, I felt bad that I, 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 I'd, I'd come, you know, I, I had this dramatic change, you know, where, man, I, I, I was like doing stuff every day, doing, you know, and, and all of a sudden I was free. But I still smoke cigarettes. And, and I, I knew, and even though I was, you know, not the most churched person, uh, I, 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 didn't, I didn't go to church and praise and worship and spark up a, a cigarette, you know. One time, though, I was in church, and it was in this church which is now a really large church, but back then we met at the community center, and, and uh, we are in worship. And I noticed this smoke coming over this person like three rows in front of me, you know? Just like a little vapor of smoke coming up. And in my mind, I, I got pulled out of the spirit really quickly. And I, I looked around in the building, and there was actually a no smoking sign right on the wall. I thought, hey, hey, what's up here? There's no smoking in here. And what I realized later is they'd taken, you remember back when breath sprays were in? Yeah. They'd gone, psh, psh. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I, I just, as a new Christian, I thought, well, I, you know, I'm not going to smoke in church. And I went through this whole battle of, you know, uh, you know my whole battle, I, I sound like it's terrible. It went on for like two, three months or so, but I was like, I'd buy a pack and then I'd, I'd think, no, and I'd crush it and throw it, you know, and then I'd buy a pack, and I threw one out the window one time when I was driving. I probably, it was littering, I know, but don't worry. I drove around the block, and I found the exact place I threw it, I went and found them. Went and found those babies, and, you know, I tried different tricks to make myself quit, and I just felt guilty about it. And then one night, I'm just sitting at home, and God said to me, he said this. He said in my heart, it wasn't an audible voice. Not talking that, but just in my heart, he spoke words to me that I heard and understood. He said, Paul, he said, I'm not going to love you anymore when you quit than I do right now. I said, really? I mean, I, I, that's in my mind. I think what I was trying to do, I was trying to gain more approval, trying to gain his acceptance. But the thing is, is you are accepted. Flaws and all, you're accepted. You're not, you're not a new creature because you've done everything right. You're a new creature because God loves you so much and Jesus paid the price for you. You've just accepted what Jesus did for you. Let me read this scripture or two and we'll, we'll close with this. Romans 6. We're talking about baptism, but we're still talking about down to earth. We're talking about living life here on this earth like it is in heaven. Wow. So in, Matthew, or in Romans 6, verse 3, it says, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Wow. Let me read verse 6. It says, knowing this, our old man, that's not your father, that's the person you used to be before you were born again. The old person you used to be. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, and we'd no longer be slaves of sin. You see, that's what sin does. It makes people slaves. And then the Richard translation says this. It says, Our former evil identities have been executed, so to speak. Our old rebel selves were exterminated, and that leaves us no further role to perform. We're linked to the divine representative in his death. Wow, I like that. The, our old evil identities were exterminated, so to speak, leaving us no further role to perform. That means whatever I used to be, man, that thing is gone. I don't need to perform that way anymore. I'm free. I'm free. So water baptism, man, all that stuff is true about you before you go into the water, but all you're doing, you're going in, you're following the commands of Jesus, you're being baptized. It's a public demonstration, a picture of what happened to you in Christ. 
Thank you for listening to Liberty Christian Center's podcast. To partner with this ministry or for any additional information, please visit libertychristiancenter.org.